I invite you to turn to Esther chapter 9. Hopefully your Bible just kind of opens up there now. It's our fifth week in Esther and our last week in Esther for now. 387. I got it right. <laughs> You'll see that on the screen from here on out. And in the follow Jesus Bible is on page 508. And when it's applicable to the Jesus Storybook Bible, we'll have that in there too. Obviously, it's a much smaller a condensed version of, of the Bible. It just has some of the key stories in there. And unfortunately, Ruth is not in there either, so uh, it's going to be a little while before I can uh, reference the Jesus Storybook uh, Bible. A couple things here. Um, before we read this narrative in chapter 9 and, and 10, uh, where I'm going and where I'm not going and where we've been and so forth to get us ready for this last bit of Esther. I chose to talk about Holy War last week, so I don't need to do it this week. Um, last week we talked about the edict that allowed the Israelites or the Jews to uh, defend themselves. And really what Xerxes, King Xerxes was doing was commencing a war within his own kingdom, uh, with his own people against the Jews. It's kind of crazy when you, when you think about it, but he sanctioned it with two edicts uh, to, to do this. And now when we think about Holy War, it's a difficult, very difficult and complex topic. And we talked a little bit about that last week. That really the ultimate 30,000, 50,000 foot goal of what God is doing is really justice and judgment. But creating a space, a holy space for a holy God. Remember his bottom of his foot touching the earth as a footstool? And his throne was up in heaven where he was seated? And just the bottom of his feet touching this earth needed to be cleared of all evil. Because holiness and evil don't mix. Right? So there's, there's this idea of separation and removal of evil. And that's what redemption is really all about, individually and collectively. And we're going to see that this morning in its largest and biggest picture in the story of theme throughout Scripture. So at the bottom, you see the triumph of holiness and has said God's love over evil. That's what we really see in this warfare. And God utilized warfare, literal physical warfare, in the past on his behalf. But we live in different times post-Christ. Where there's place for war for the government, that's not the posture we take as Christians. We see physical violence toward one another. There's spiritual warfare that we engage in. But it's crystal clear that that's not against flesh and blood. All right, so this gets a little tricky, some of the language and the complexity with it. And again, if anybody wants to talk further about this, I'm more than happy to navigate that with them and all its complexities. All right? So there's one thing. And I'm not going to spend a, uh, much time on this Feast of Purim. All right? it, it's, it's not directly relevant for us today. It's part of our history. The Jewish history is part of our history as well. We're going to see the text. And many think that Esther was actually included and written to legitimize the Feast of Esther. And you'll hear that language. It's like, why do you keep saying this? Um, he's trying to prove that, that this feast is rooted in history and, and needs, to, needs to be followed. It's a story and a feast of deliverance. All right, we've already read this and hinted toward it. That the Jewish people are able now to defend themselves and they're going to be delivered from the first edict of Haman of overthrowing the Jews. So keep that in mind. Purim is about deliverance. Because right, that's where we're going to be going with this. Divine destiny is about deliverance. Okay? So Chapter 9 is going to be a hard chapter. It's going to talk a lot about warfare, and then it's going to move into the celebration of the victory there and the um, commencement of the holy uh, feast of Purim. All right, so we do this like we did in the past. I'm going to read through this. And again, either kick back and close your eyes and listen to the story of Bull, or your visual person will be up on the screen and follow along in a couple of Bibles that you have in front of you now to follow along. Then I'll pray about that a little bit more. So now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse 
occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with a sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parthendatha and Delphon and Aspatha and Paratha and Adelia and Eridatha and Parmasha and Erisai and Eridai and Isapha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Amadab, the enemy of the Jews. But they laid no hand on the plunder. This very day, the number of those killed, or that very day, the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, In Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, and also the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's evening. And let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them. But they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th day, they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th and rested on the 15th day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who lived in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Xerxes, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar, and also the 15th day of the same, year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman and Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast her, that is, cast lots, to crush and to destroy them. But when, when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head, and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore they called the, these days Purim, after the term her. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter, and of what they had faced in this matter, and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring, and all who joined them, that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written, and at that time appointed every year. That these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, in every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel, and Mordecai the Jew,
you gave the full written authority confirming the second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Xerxes in words of peace and truth that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their feet or fast and their lamenting. The command of Queen Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. King Xerxes imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea, and all the acts of his power and might, and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, and he was great among the Jews, and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. Heavenly Father, as we take a look at this story, this narrative that took place a very long time ago, I pray that the themes and principles within it may inspire and encourage us to follow you more humbly and obediently. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Some of you might recognize who this is. Anybody? As soon as I go to this next one, you're going to have a pretty good idea. He was a painter from the 17th century who painted these irises. He's also painted sunflowers, one of his favorite subjects to paint. He painted Starry Night. Come on now. You gotta know your, your art, right? Vincent Van Gogh, yes. You might recognize this uh, older picture of, of, of him. Vincent Van Gogh was a fascinating person. Many of you know his, his story. He had a troubled life, like many of us, all of us do in various de degrees. All right, he wasn't a great student, but he was great at math, supposedly. But he dropped out of, of school. And eventually he became a missionary, a pastor, to a coal mining town. And it was dark, and it was bleak, and people were dying, and they were living on meager means. It, it was an awful kind of setting. Uh, but he persevered there for a couple of years. And out of that, he came to realize that, well, maybe this is not where God wants him to be. And he started to, to draw. And it was really there where he found that he had a particular knack for drawing and for painting. And so he decided that that's where he was going to go. But as he moved forward, none of his works were recognized by anybody of any significance. And he battled depression and ended up actually taking his life at age 37. Unknown to the world. Another painter who painted prolifically and no one was really going to benefit from that work. It was only after his death that people began to recognize the value and the beauty and the skill and the elegance of Van Gogh and how he captured emotion and color and vibrance. You can actually see the movement in his paintings when he started, they were dark. I mean, literally, they were dark. And as he moved forward through his time where he was a missionary and, and further where those themes and principles and the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ penetrated more deeply within him, his paintings became like those sunflowers and those irises more and more bright. Now, the point of this is that in Go's best life, Griffith was not during his life. It was after his, his life. In, in some ways, right? And we're going to be seeing that in many ways that is true for us as well. This is not our best life now. That because of some massive reversals that happen, God's divine destiny for us is not located fully here in this life. Much like Van Gogh, his divine destiny really wasn't fully developed in this life. It was only afterwards where the realization and actualization of that came forth. 
All right, so that line, this is where we're going to be going. It's based on this verse. It's, it's right at the very beginning, the first verse of chapter 9. All right, we're going to talk about the first edict where the Jews were going to get wiped out, but then the second edict came that they can defend themselves. And the consequence of that is that um, even the governors and the satraps and the leaders, because of the fear of Mordecai, all joined in, and it wasn't even a contest. They overthrew their enemies, the one that had hated them. And so the, the reverse occurred. And again, that's the theme. That's what we're holding on to. The reverse occurred. The reversals in God's divine destiny is based on two massive, great reversals that we're going to be talking about this morning. But see, this theme was all through Esther. If you're paying attention, it was all through Esther. This, this is only a few of them. The list is actually about 15 long, but these are the main ones. All right, Esther was an orphan, and she became queen. There's a great reversal there. He, uh, Haman is exalted through the first part of the, the book, and then he's executed and killed on his very own gallows. Mordecai is the one who's brought low in mourning. His people are going to be slaughtered. And then he's raised up, really, to Haman's place in the right hand of King Xerxes. The city of Susa is thrown into confusion, and then afterwards, the city of Susa is rejoicing. Jews are to be killed, and then the enemies of the Jews are killed. Haman is wealthy, and then Haman is stripped of all his wealth. We saw that last week. So there's, there's just all, all through Esther, whoever wrote this, whether it was Mordecai or Esther or someone else, they were very intentional to say, there's a theme of reversal in God's story. And we got to pay attention to it. And this theme of reversal becomes explicit when we come to the New Testament and with Jesus Christ. And that's where we're going to go with this. And we're going to see this in two massive movements for the disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay? Conversion and resurrection. I want us to understand these as reversals. Because if we don't understand these as reversals, we're not understanding the biblical idea of what these things get at. Alright? So conversion is going to be about sin and the reversing of life from one direction and in one means to another. It's going to reverse. Alright? And resurrection is going to be really about death and the reversal of that. We're going to take a look at what that means. Right? So one of the most beautiful lines in this, and Colleen hinted at this as well when she was speaking, turn for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. This is what the great reversals are all about, turning mourning into a holiday, a holy day. Right? This is what God does. This is redemption. This is salvation. This is the good news. Okay, So we're going to take a, a look at that and tease that out just a little bit. But an important note here, I'm probably going to pick this up, although they, 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 they made a big deal about it. Uh, it said that this was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. That's when they were attacking and killing and destroying with the sword, bloody. And on the 14th day, they rested and made that day a day of feasting and gladness. And, and the other was the 15th day, because they were battling on the 14th. Day. So the 14th day and the 15th day were two days of celebration. So what were they celebrating? And what were they not celebrating? Explicitly. They were not celebrating warfare and killing and destroying other human beings. What they were celebrating is peace, victory, rest. The way things kind of go back the way they're supposed to be in some ways. They're trying to take the focus off this, this destruction, if you will, and more on to the shalom and, and aspects of it. All right? Now, we're going to really see this played out again, and we should understand this in and through, through Jesus Christ. So let's talk about this idea of, not the idea, uh, the fact of conversion. For every disciple of Jesus, this is one of the most massively important words for us to understand. Because it's what has happened to you if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
And conversion itself is another word for reversal. All right? Right at the top there, you got to understand this is about grace. Again, Colleen talked about this, this. This is not just a little bit of grace. This is the abundant, amazing grace of God extended to us sinners who are enemies of God, who deserve the sword, if you will, condemnation and judgment. All right? But because of God's grace, His gift, that's what grace is, gift, giving, He gave is the ultimate of himself, gift is given to us, not because we deserve it or earn it. Right? It's because he loves us. And he gives himself for us. And that conversion is actuated through faith. But there's a lot going on between grace and faith here. You're saved by grace through faith. Right? So, so that middle line there, all this is happening. And they're simultaneously, all right? There's this reversal by definition that has happened for you if you've been converted to a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's this um, massively important principle of repentance, which means a turning away from one way of life and turning towards another way of life. I repent of the way I was living before. I repent of my sins because they're antithetical against Contra, not the way God wants things to be. And I turn toward the way things are supposed to be, according to God and His truth and scriptures. Right? So it's a turning away from something and a turning away towards something. It's a reversal, if you will. And it's because of the prior work of the Holy Spirit, we saw this in Acts explicitly, of regeneration. Regenerating our dried up, shriveled, hardened hearts. He brings them to life. All right? And faith is not just uh, understanding correctly something, it's, it's a trust as well. Every one of you demonstrated trust this morning when you got in the car and you weren't the driver. Right? You kind of put your the, your safety into their hands, or whenever you get into an airplane, you're literally putting your lives in the hands of the pilot. So you can say all you want about, I trust the pilot to fly this plane safely, or I trust the driver of this car to drive this car safely, but it doesn't mean a hill of beans until you actually get in the car and get in the plane and you start moving. That's faith. It's both of those. It's a belief and a trust as well. All right? So it demonstrates a reversal of what you are no longer about but what you are for. And it's for such a time as this. We have to understand that our conversion, your conversion, my conversion, was for such a time as this. We saw this in Acts, if you were around for that. Acts 17. So God determined your time to be here at this place, in this juncture, in the world, chronologically in time, but in place as well. You are meant to be right here, right now. God designed you for such a time as this. And so your conversion is for such a time as this. And he's got a purpose for each one of us, within our families, within our work, within our neighborhoods, wherever that might be, all those things for such a time as this. You got purpose. I've got purpose. We've got purpose. God put you here for such a time as this. Just like Esther back then for such a time as this. And we both we're, we're all have the same attitude as Esther. Well, if I perish, I perish. Because I believe this to be true. And even if the world turns on me, and I end up dying for it, so be it. Because I believe this to be true. We're going to see this explicitly with the, with the resurrection. That sin doesn't have the final say, but either does death. So if I perish, I perish. We just think about it. Death is just a doorway. There's nothing frightening about a doorway. Especially when you know what's on the other side of that doorway. If I perish, I perish. For such a time as this, it calls for boldness and courage, just like Esther. The other big reversal is resurrection. 
And this one's a little harder to get our minds wrapped around because this is largely future orientated, where we are promised new bodies. Not new bodies like these bodies, just redid and, yeah, we just moved. Upgraded, big time bodies. This is not like going from 2.0 to 3.0. This is going from 2.0 to 10 billion point oh kind of thing. All right? To where we, we really don't have the full idea of, of what this looks like other than what we saw in Christ who had a resurrected body. Still flesh and blood. Stick your hand in this. Ate fish. But then was materializing out of thin air in the rooms with the doors locked. Are you kidding me? I want to be like that. That's going to be cool. The things that we're going to be able to do. And what sin has limited us in our thinking, but in our, our, our bodily, biological ways as, as well. New bodies are going to blow you away, going to blow us away, and all their perfections of what we are supposed to be. And not only that, those new bodies are going to enjoy a new heaven and a new earth. See, this is a ruined heaven and earth. Massively ruined. We talk about it every Sunday. Of the pain and injustices and sorrow and bloodshed and warfare. All these things that are antithetical to the kingdom of God and will not be in the kingdom of God and will not be a part of this earth. Nor heaven. And heaven just is the space that we occupy as well. Will not be there. Gone. Nothing to thwart us, hinder us, ruin us in any kind of way. That's astounding. That's our destiny. That's what's on the other side of the doorway. For such a time as this, if I perish, I perish. I want to get to that other side of the doorway. Right? And, and on top of this, this is for eternity. This is not just like a little test run where it only goes for uh, 10,000 years. Now we're saying about that amazing, right? 10,000 years. This goes on for eternity. There's no end to this. It's forever. Nothing breaks this because there's no enemy. There's nothing in here that's going to stop this. This is forever. The lives that we live now prepare us for eternity. We live in end times. It's hard for us to think of something that's timeless that keeps going on and on. But if you do that, I guarantee you'll get goosebumps down your spine. I'm never, ever, ever ending. Never, ever. Never, ever ending. It's crazy. And, and okay, this is gets better. All right, we, we think we're going to get there, and it's going to be static. When we get there, and we, we have this, we've got our little chair and our wings, and we're, we're singing, you know, kind of thing. And it's going to be like that for eternity. It's like, no thank you. That's not inspiring at all. Scriptures go way beyond this. Heaven's going to be a progressive, perpetual increase in delight and joy. Our God is an infinite God. You can never reach the end. And we're going to be tapping into that in ways that we cannot tap into it here. Progressively, perpetually increasing in the amount of delight and joy that we experience. Not just individually, but collectively with one another. Are you kidding me? That's on the other side of the door. That's what these great reversals tell us. Conversion and resurrection. They're massive. And Esther is pointing at that in her story here. That good wins. Beautiful wins. Truth wins. Not the Hamans of this world, but the Mordecais and the Esthers of this world who place their faith in the living God. This is our divine destiny, friends, for those who are in Christ. Adopted children by grace into the family. Right? Yes, there is beauty and goodness and truth today. Right? Yet, yet, what lies ahead is immeasurably more. So magnificent, magnificent that it makes our present sorrows shrink to being light and momentary compared to the eternal weight of glory. That's how Paul phrases what I just said. He suffered a lot. To him, it was light and momentary. 
compared to thinking about what's on the other side of the doorway, that eternal weight of glory. He's not minimizing the pain of sorrow now. He's just put it in perspective. Because if we compare it toward one another, mm, we compare it to what the future and eternity holds. And that's what Paul's doing here as well. This is why we have to understand conversion and resurrection and what's on the other side of the door. The hope that we have is not found in the things of this world. It's found in Jesus Christ and what he has already accomplished and the promises of what he's going to do in the future. Just like Van Gogh. There's beauty. These irises are beauty. And you know what irises stand for? Victory. Truth. Peace. All these things, royalty actually as well. Paris, then go to life, reversals. May we hold to the truths of what God has done and what he promises to each one of us. May we live for such a time as this. And if I perish, if we perish, we perish. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these encouraging words from Esther. We thank you for um, the incredible, massive story of reversal in and through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived the life that we could not, the perfect life, the righteous life, so that in him we might find our righteousness. And who took our sinfulness, our unrighteousness, and was crucified for it killed for it, became a ransom for us, paid the price for us, took your wrath for us, and was raised to life after life after death, conquering not just sin, but death as well. Death arrested, and in the future arrested forever. So Lord, may this good news change us, transform us, help us take the next steps of faith, that we might be conformed more to the image of your Son, Jesus, in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. And of course, we've already laid the foundations for communion this morning, where the work of our conversion happened in and through Jesus Christ. Not just the crucifixion, but his entire life. Again, we, we look at the entirety of who Jesus is. From his birth, the incarnation, all the way through his returning once again. That because of Jesus, we can turn from that old way of life and embrace a new way of life. And because of Jesus, we can hold to the hope that we have on the other side of that doorway. That the experience of wine skins in the smoke is just a temporary, light, momentary kind of thing compared to the eternal weight of glory waiting for us.